Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Amen. We're going to go to John 3. Anybody ever heard of this verse? John 3, 16, one of the most famous verses of the Bible. You know, <clears throat> I bring this up a lot of times when I talk about John 3, 16. You got to realize that, how many were raised church? Raise your hand if you were raised in church. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I was not raised in church, and I'll guarantee you, man, I remember, you know, when I was younger, as a <clears throat> young teenager, you'd see these ball games and stuff on TV, and you'd see somebody holding up a big sign. Remember? John 3.16. I'm like, who's this John guy? Seriously. And what's the 3.16 all about? I didn't know. I had no idea. I mean, you know, we need to do a little bit better than just that when it comes to witnessing, right? Because you're trying to obviously witness to a sinner. I had no idea they were referring to the Bible. Tonight's study is the reason for grace. Thank God for grace. Say it. Thank God. <clears throat> so we're going to find out biblically... From the scriptures, the reason for grace. You know, grace has been something that now, uh, even more in the day we're living in, is being distorted, misunderstood, taught wrong. You know, even in context to what we see, it's not new because this happened even back in the days of Jude. You pretty much have, for the most part, in all of Christianity, Christendom, uh, today, no different than the Bible times, two extremes that you've always seen. One's a religious extreme. Got to live perfect. You don't live right. God's not happy with you. He's going to beat you down. <clears throat> Whatever. Uh, do bad things to you. Not true. Say not true. not true. Then you got the other extreme. Doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter where you go. Hey, you're saved by grace. Praise God. So God's already done it all. Nothing else you need to do. Not true. Say not true. Not true. We go down the middle of the road, which the Bible teaches us to do, that thank God we don't earn anything from God, but because of grace, we are going to live a life that is honoring to Him and walk out what He has for us. Amen? Number one on your notes, <clears throat> you must have an understanding on a couple of things about the grace of God if you're really going to enjoy it. How many know grace is, grace is to be enjoyed? So to really enjoy it, there's some things that you really need to understand. I know this verse is familiar with y'all, but let's look at it anyway. John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Say, that was me. <clears throat> you're not of the world anymore. You're in it, but you're not of it. So God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son... That, underline this please, whoever believes. Whoever believes, there is a part we have to play. Whoever believes in him should therefore not perish but have everlasting life. God proved his love to us by giving his son to die for us, his only begotten son, that if we would believe, believe in him. Now I want to emphasize the phrase here in the actual English language that is actually brought out even in the Greek language. The phrase is believes. Believes. It's not a one-time thing as you're about to see. It is an ongoing thing that we're to do as believers. But really clearly, you and I understand that we had nothing to do with creating the ability for us to be born again and saved. God's the one that made that possible. So what are a couple things we need to understand about the grace of God if we're really going to enjoy it? 1A. 1A. Number one, you must know that God's grace was given, not earned. God's grace was given, not earned. To enjoy it, we don't earn it. You can fall prey, proof for God so loved that he did what? He gave. He gave. You know, you can see people all the time. If you actually took a scale and, you know, you went from, you know, super religious, I got to earn everything, I got to live perfect to live loosey-goosey, just do whatever I want, and then come to the middle, you know, reality is people tend to drift to one side or the other. And a lot of times you got people who obviously from a religious perspective drift over to this thing that I got to be perfect, do just right, whatever, or God can't help me. Or No, he couldn't have helped you if you had to be perfect to begin with in the very start. He helped you because you needed help. Say, thank God I got it. So the reason he was willing to give us this grace is because he knew we needed help. I love one of the definitions Dr. Barclay gives us about grace, heaven's help. Grace is heaven's help. So one, you got to know that God's grace was what? It was given, not earned. 
Therefore, could I ever earn more of God's grace? I really can't. Now, I've talked about this before. How many you know the Bible says there's more grace to be had? Right? God gives grace to the humble. Now, I'm not earning it. I'm just simply humbling myself to acknowledge what he has available to me so that I can actually experience more of God's grace. Notice this 1B. Number two, the second thing you need to understand is God's grace has always been what? <clears throat> now, that sounds counterproductive to what we just said. No, he didn't, you didn't earn it. God gave it, but it is conditional. What's the condition? Whoever believes. So I do have to believe. If I don't have a belief in what God has said in his word of how to receive grace, how could I receive it? You couldn't. He clearly said, whoever believes in him would not perish. So they'll receive this grace. 1C, not everyone will exercise their faith to receive this gift of grace, even though he died for every human being. Sad to say, right? He died for every human being, but not all are going to receive this gift of grace, even though it's free, because again, the condition is that you have to do what? Believe. Believe. Now, the phrase again in the language here is actually in a verb form, and it is a continuous, continuous tense verb form, meaning it's not a one-time thing. So 1D, the word believes, is a continuous verb. And basically, you would say it this way. I have believed, I do believe, and I will keep on believing. Why does Jesus say you got to be obviously a believer who is faithful all the way to the end? Could we deny him? Could we blaspheme the Holy Spirit? If we do, is there a forgiveness for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? No. So for me to continue to walk in that grace... I not only put my faith in what Jesus did, think about this. I not only put my faith in what Jesus did, I still do today. So the moment you get born again, this free gift of grace that was given to you, don't get into a position of a mindset after you're born again, I got to earn now from God what he's freely given me. No, the, the same way that you put your faith in originally to believe for it, guess what? You just keep believing, right? But you don't stop. You got to keep on exercising belief and faith for that. So it's important to understand that that phrase believes means that it is conditional and it is a continuous verb and it's something that we continue to do. You should look to God every day believing for God's grace to help you. Aren't you glad about that? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, we'll see a little bit more about this. I talked about this with our, uh, not this verse, but I talked about this with our men in our men's meeting on uh, Sunday night, or excuse me, on Friday night, we talked about the fact that clearly, as a believer, you and I know we do not earn anything from God. We exercise faith in what Jesus has done for us to receive from God what he's provided. But we obviously continue to exercise faith. It's not a one-time thing and we're done. We're going to keep on exercising faith for what he's promised. Ephesians chapter 2, number 2 on your notes there says, We are saved by grace through what? Faith. Through faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Some people think, some people think that they don't have to do anything and that God will do it all. But again, that's not true because it does take faith to receive this grace that he offers. Ephesians chapter 2 clearly tells us this, beginning in verse 8. For by grace, heaven's help, for by grace you have been saved. Now, I love that phrase because saying that you have been saved is not just the salvation experience, right? What's the word saved mean? Talked about again this morning, sozo. So by grace, you have been what? You have been given a form of deliverance from sin. But what else have you been given? For by grace, you have been healed. For by grace, you have been made whole. For by grace, you have been blessed. Amen. Amen? By grace, you have been saved through again, through what? Through faith and not not of what? Yourselves. It is the... So for people that tend to lean over in the works mentality of trying to get from God what he obviously provides for us as a gift and thinking if I don't live perfect, I can't get it. Realize it's not God holding back because you're not living perfect, perfect. You're not lining up with receiving what he's already done. He's already provided it. So you got to understand I'm still not earning anything from God because I could somehow brag about what I did. You know, people even in charismatic circles kind of get off in this in prayer because they start talking about stuff that actually happens because they prayed. How many know we need to pray for stuff to happen? But really, if we're praying biblically, what are we doing? God's using us to pray. We're simply lining ourselves up with his purpose. We're not praying about what we desire. How many know God wants to bring outpouring in the last days? How many know God wants to bring a move of God in the last days? 
But you know what? You see this all through Scripture. Brother Hagin teaches it in context talking about prayer. He said, you can go back to every great move of God, and guess what you'll find? Somebody was praying. Now, we got to be careful we don't fall into a position to think that happened because of me. No, it happened because of God. You were just willing to let God use you to be able to pray through you to bring about what he wanted to do. So we got to be so careful we don't fall into this thing thinking somehow I did this or somehow I accomplished this. Because if you do, you're not really walking in the grace of God. Grace of God means he did it, not me. I just allowed him to do it through me or use me to make it happen. Amen. So clearly, again, it's through faith and not not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, it's not of works. It's not of works, lest any man should do what boast. So when he's talking about grace in that aspect, he's talking about, of course, salvation. Talking about being born again. But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Now, I love this actual rendering in the Amplified. And especially in, in, in the Greek confirms this. We are his work of art. His work of art. Now, I forget exactly how the Amplified words it, but basically it's stating the fact that we are a work of art by the hand of God. He's the one that made us, once we're born again, who we now are as a new spirit being. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So who made you? God did. We're His workmanship. Say, I am. His workmanship. So we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Tell me. Be careful now for good works. Why did He create you? To do good works. Not to earn anything, to line up with who he now made you to be. To line up with what he gave you as a free gift of this new person. So we are created for good works, which God did what? What did God do? He prepared these beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. How's the Amplified word, Kathy? Oh, it says, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus to do good works. Taking paths that he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. So I think about like what the Bible talks about as it relates to the children of Israel. I mean, you know, God had already gone before them, prepared the way. So, so guess what? He's already gone before me and you to prepare the way for us to walk out the good works he has for us to walk out. So we're not earning anything. He prepared the way. Who prepared the way? He did. What am I learning? How to walk in what he prepared. So we got to be careful that we don't fall into this thought that somehow I got to earn something from God or somehow I have earned something for God, from God because I could not brag about in context of its grace that I could not brag about myself that I did it. I brag about God. God's the one that made it possible. Amen. So let's read it again. Verse eight. By grace, you have been saved. Say, thank you, Jesus. Again, it's through faith. Circle or highlight those two words. It is through faith. It's not of yourselves, of your own power or ability or effort. It is the gift of God. What is? The grace of God. Notice, it is not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not of works, referring here actually, in this context, to the Old Testament works of the law. You could not, by the Old Testament works of the law, save yourself. That's why Jesus needed to come. Jesus fulfilled those works. Now, don't get confused here. Jesus fulfilled the work of the Old Testament. Remember, he completed it so that we could now do good works for God. Not of the Old Testament, but live a life of which God could work through us. If we're really walking in the gift of grace, guess what it really means? God's working through me. God's manifesting through me. God's doing through me what only he can do. I'm just simply allowing him to use me to do that. Whether it's prayer or anything else I do, I'm walking in what God prepared beforehand. So if he prepared it beforehand, it's not me doing it. I'm just walking in the light of what he already prepared. So this is a key issue of understanding the power of grace. So again, number two, we are saved by grace through faith. Some people think that they don't have to do anything and that God will do it all. Is that true? No, you're prepared. Excuse me. You have been uh, brought into this family and actually been given the ability to do good works he prepared beforehand. So there are things for us to do. 2A, we are not saved by the works again of the Old Testament law. That's what that's referring to in verse 9. But, notice this, to be, faith requires what? Oh, but I thought we weren't saved by work. We're not. We're not saved by the works of the Old Testament, right? That's what that's referring to. But faith requires works because faith without corresponding action is dead. 
I've got to have an action in my life that goes along with what I believe for me to experience the grace of God. You could not just believe. You know how many people will die and go to hell believing there's a God? But they won't act upon that belief. And therefore they won't get born again, sad to say. And they'll go to hell because of it. Why? No corresponding action. They didn't confess with their mouth and act upon that word to be able to receive what he had for them. So you understand the balance there. We're not working for anything. But faith has to have action because if I believe it for faith to work, I've got to act upon what I believe. 2C, we were created again for what? Good works that God again prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So think about this. Right now, God has prepared for your life good works awaiting for you to live out. And those good works are going to glorify God. Hallelujah. And all we have to do is simply do what? Start learning to live by faith. If we live by faith, we'll walk in this path of what God's prepared for us beforehand. Because we're going to act upon what the Word of God says. Does the Bible say go lay hands on the sick? Did you know that there's already people, go to James 2. Did you know that there's already people God has already prepared beforehand to receive His very work of deliverance and healing that is something He wants to use you for. He's just simply waiting for us to be obedient to step out in faith and let Him use us. So again, he prepared these works beforehand. Look at this in James, of course, because we'll clarify a little bit more about what it means that faith, of course, without works is dead. And that's where a lot of confusion even comes into today. Because when you start talking about obedience to God or works, you know, people get into this thing about misunderstanding. Well, we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. True, but that's talking about the works of the Old Testament law. Because clearly, faith is not faith without some form of works or corresponding action. So if we act in line with the Bible, guess what we're going to experience? What's our title tonight? Reason for grace. So faith requires action. If we walk with corresponding action in our faith, what are we going to experience more of? Grace, heaven's help. We're going to walk in the path of what God already prepared beforehand. Amen? So this is why it's so important to understand this. James chapter 2 tells us this, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Profit meaning benefit. How does it benefit someone who says he has faith but does not have works? Question, can faith save him? No. No. If all you do is have a belief in God, right? You believe in God, that's faith. You believe Jesus died, that's faith. But what if you don't act on it? See, faith alone won't save you. you got to have a corresponding action that goes along with what you believe for it to work. If you put, how many remember the day you put your corresponding action in line with your faith in what Jesus did for you? Guess what happened? You stepped into grace. You didn't save yourself. Your works didn't save you. Your faith did. But your faith had to have corresponding action for that to take place. And it continues to work the same way today. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit them? Does it profit them? No, No, not at all. 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, corresponding action, it is what? Dead. Dead, lifeless, will not work. So are you understanding the balance here between the fact I get to walk in the gift of grace, I get to walk in heaven's help, but that doesn't happen without me not just believing, but acting in line with what I believe. My acting in line doesn't earn anything. I'm stepping into a pathway of what God prepared for me to walk in already. God already had it waiting. He already had it awaiting for me. All I did is simply step out in faith to act upon what he said to partake of that grace. Amen? Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now this is a little bit of a confusing rendering here. The actual rendering is some will say, well, I've got faith. I know I do. Others will say, well, I know I do because I have works is how it's worded. One person will say, well, I got faith. Another one will say, well, I have faith too, but I have corresponding action that goes with my faith show me your faith that person would then say without your corresponding action 
You see the statement here? What he's saying is, you got, so you got two people, let's say that in a conversation. One guy said, well, I got faith. Okay, but I've got corresponding action that goes with mine. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Have you ever acted upon that and asked him to be the Lord of your life? No. Well, that doesn't help you. Well, I have faith. Okay, so you got a belief in God. But see, I have works, corresponding action, that has now helped me to enter into grace. To receive the free gift of salvation. Show me your faith without your works. Guess what? They cannot. Show me. Show me. Show me you have a belief in God without your works. Can't do it. You got to have corresponding action to show you got faith. And I will show you my faith by my corresponding action. Amen? Amen. Meaning what? I'll show you true faith because true faith takes corresponding action. Are you earning anything acting upon your faith? No. You're receiving the grace of what God has. How many of you know healing is a grace? Hallelujah. How many of you know peace is a grace? Joy is a grace. All these are gifts of God, part of what we receive by grace. So there's a lot misunderstood here when you talk about this because seriously, the devil doesn't really want people to receive more grace. So if he can convince them, well, you don't need to get it all into that work stuff. No, I'm not earning anything. But to sit here and say, I'm going to live any way I want. Okay, so live any way you want. If you live any way you want, contrary to what the Bible says as to how we enter into what God has, are you still walking in works corresponding with faith? No. If you say you believe God in an area, but you have no corresponding action that goes along with that, because I don't have to work for anything, you're not working for anything, you're working out. And this is what people misunderstand about grace. Say this. This this will help you say this. Say grace is not work for. It's worked out. God prepared beforehand what we're to walk in, right? We're to work out our salvation with reverence to God and trembling. So what we're doing is we're working out what he prepared beforehand. We're not earning anything. So he goes on and says here clearly in verse 19, Now you believe there's one God. Well, you do well, but even the demons believe and tremble, right? But they don't respond. They don't act upon what they believe. 20, but you, watch this. Do you want to know, oh, foolish man, say foolish man, that faith without works is what? Now, every time I see these words in the Bible in the New Testament, I can't help but think of the parable of the ten virgins. He just defined God did another foolish believer, right? Right? You don't want to be a foolish virgin. You want to be a wise virgin. Guess who foolish virgins are in this context? They're they're people who believe, but they don't have any action that goes in line with what they believe. I'm not saying, God's saying that. God's saying, you're foolish. You're foolish. He says, do you want to know, oh foolish man, verse 20, that faith without works is dead. Now that word means useless. That That word actually even means worthless. And powerless. Your faith is worthless without corresponding action. Right. See, I can't claim to receive healing without acting on it. Right. There's got to be some acting on it. Remember when Jesus told the man who was let down through the roof, you know, take up your bed and walk. Yeah. Was he healed yet? No. He was not. He was not healed yet. But guess what he did? He acted upon what God said, what Jesus said. And the moment he acted, guess what came? Healing came, but not before he acted. See, a lot of people are waiting, and then they think, well, somehow I have to earn it. No, 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 no. You're not earning anything. You're receiving the grace God has for you, but you're doing it by what? Corresponding action. Because if you really believe, you're going to act upon what you believe. I mean, I, I say that. I mean, people can believe and not act, but true faith is going to do what? It's going to act upon what it believes. 21, notice this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar, God asked him to take his son up and give him up as a, as a sacrifice. Tell me that wasn't faith to act upon what he was given as a command by, or as a, as, a, as a word spoken by God, and then God provided the sacrifice. 22, do you see that? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made what? <clears throat> Perfect. So there would have been no context of a sacrifice given on behalf of Isaac to prepare the way for Jesus had Abraham not acted upon what God asked him to do. But thank God he did. 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. Now it's not accounted to us, we are righteous. He couldn't be born again yet, Jesus hadn't died. But guess what God did? God for the rest of Abraham's life looked at him as if he already was born again. 
It was accredited to him, another way to say it. It was accredited to him for righteousness, and he was called the what? Come on, tell me. The friend of God. Well, guess who you are once you're born again? You're the friend of God. Verse 24. You see then that a man is what? He's justified by... He's justified by... The wait a minute, Pastor, I thought we're justified by faith. Faith without corresponding action is dead. You're not justified again. Justified meaning what? Declared righteous. You're not declared righteous just because you believe Jesus died. Are you? Are you? I mean, you meet sinners that believe Jesus died. Are they justified? Are they declared righteous yet? Not until they act upon what they believe. So you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith what? Only. So it's not works like I got to be perfect and do everything just right and God will accept me. Nope. It's corresponding action with the fact that I believe in what Jesus did. So I act upon that very faith. 25. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Remember that when they came to Jericho? 26, for as the body, your physical outer body, without the spirit is dead. If your spirit leaves your body, guess what? Your body's dead. It's lifeless. Lifeless. So faith without what? Works Works is what? So let's keep a balance here. We understand we're not working for anything for God, to get anything from God. Everything we receive from God is all because of grace. It's a free gift. Thank God. But we got to understand, too, that if I believe in what Jesus did for me to have what he provided, prepared beforehand, I can't just say I believe it. i got to act as if it's so, because that's what faith does. I'm not earning anything. I'm stepping into what he has. Now, do you know why? Because that's what faith requires. Faith requires corresponding action, or it doesn't work. Faith requires corresponding action, or it does not work. No corresponding action. Faith has no ability to go to work for you to receive what's already yours. You're not earning it. It's already yours. Amen. Amen. I said amen. amen. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. You know, I think about this as it relates to healing all the time. Should I be declaring my body healed? Yes, you should. God says you are. Should I act upon that word? Yes, you should. If you don't act upon that word, will your faith work by you just simply believing it alone? No. You got to act upon that word. You got to put faith, uh, you got to, excuse me, you got to put uh, action to your faith for faith to work. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2.20. Paul here said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who what? Lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in the body, I live by faith. I live by what? Faith Faith in the Son of God who loved me and did what? Gave himself for me. Now notice this. I do not set aside the grace of God. Underline it. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So when he talks about setting aside the grace of God here, he says, I'm not going to go back. How many know the book of Galatians is all about Paul writing to the churches in Galatia because many drifted back to the law. Many drifted back to trying to uphold the law, even though they were born again, thinking I still have to uphold the law now for God to bless me. No, you don't. I'm not setting aside the grace of God. I now live by faith in the Son of God. Who do you live by? Who do you live faith by? In the Son of God. Look at it again, verse 20. I have been what? Crucified. Who's the I he's talking about? Who's the, the old spirit man. If you've never done this before and I've told you to do this, look at every reference that's a direct reference to the first person of Paul and realize it's not his soul and it's not his body, it's his spirit man. Right. I have been crucified with Christ. What I? Not his body. Right. Not his soul because the soul has to be saved, has to be renewed. Him, the spirit man. It is no longer what? I, the old spirit man who live. Aren't you glad? But who lives in me now? The anointed one does. Christ lives in me. Who me? Spirit man. And the life which I, spirit man, now live in the flesh. I, spirit man, live by what? Faith in the Son of God. So if you live by faith in the Son of God, there has to be corresponding action to what you know he said he's done for you. 
Whatever promise you have from Jesus that he said he's done for you, you have the ability to enter into the grace of God, heaven's help, to receive what he's already prepared for you to walk in. But to just say you believe it and not act upon it, it's not going to get it to work. You got to have corresponding action. Amen. But in verse 21, that corresponding action doesn't mean I set aside the grace of God. No, I'm not setting aside God's grace. I'm entering into it. Can you see that? When, what he's saying here is, is when you walk by Bible faith, you're not, you're not setting aside the grace of God in any way. Because a lot of people, again, think if you just walk by faith, then it doesn't matter what we do. That's ridiculous. Because faith requires corresponding action. So if I'm walking by faith, I'm not setting aside grace. I'm not by saying, well, I don't have to do this to earn that. Or do. Well, you're not earning anything. But I don't set aside heaven's help. I actually engage heaven's help. By walking by faith, which requires corresponding action. The life that I now live in this body, I live by faith. In the, so how do I walk by faith in this concurrent body? I have to act upon what I believe. That's not always easy. That's not always easy. When your body don't feel well and you obviously are battling something in body, you have a choice. I can act like I'm sick and accept it. Or I can choose to say, no, I believe God's word and rise up against it and say, I'm acting according to the word of God. See, people don't like to hear that, but that's the reality. If I say, I believe I'm healed, what am I supposed to do? Act like I'm healed. I've told you my testimony many times. When I got a hold of understanding healing relating to how faith worked, I guarantee you the moment that I got a revelation of that, I was in a little barn apartment by myself at the time. Kathy and I had not met yet, but afterwards we actually had our, uh, when we first uh, uh, got married, that was our first home. We still, I still lived in that little barn apartment. But in that little barn apartment one night, I'd been studying healing for about three months. I'd been hearing, you know, a series by Brother Hagen, man, over and over and over again. I'd been listening to some also by uh, some other ministers as well, Lester Summerall, but mostly Hagen. And all of a sudden that night, while I was looking at Scripture in my Bible, I've looked at, I don't know, hundreds of times, a lot of times in this time frame, all of a sudden it hit me. I'm not going to be healed. Hope you get this. I'm not going to be healed. There's not a verse that says I'm going to be healed. See, this still goes over a lot of people's heads. I'm not going to be healed. I, And the reason it does is because you don't get it in your head, you get it in your heart. It's got to become revelation to your heart. How do you get revelation in your heart? How do you become one with the word? Meditate on it, feed on it over and over and over again till you become one with it. And all of a sudden, sitting on this little recliner of mine, I jumped up and I said, I got it. I got it. I'm not going to be healed. Already am. Man, I did a little jig and run around the room. I was so excited. I got it. I got it. I got it. Lord, I'm not going to be healed. Already am healed. You're not going to heal me. You already have. And so I go to bed that night. And I was driving a rock truck back then. I had to get up 2, 3, 4 in the morning, you know, somewhere near to to go to work. And I mean, I woke up, whatever time it was to go to work that day, probably around 2, 33 o'clock. I woke up, I had every symptom of the flu. It was wintertime. Flu was going around. Boy, and let me tell you what, man, my body was not happy when I woke up. My body wanted to stay in bed. My body wanted to reach over and pick up the phone, call my boss and call in, call in, excuse me, call in, trying to help some of you, call in, sick. Faith without is dead. See, God's got heaven's help to help me to receive what's already mine. He's already prepared it for me to walk in. Preaching better than you're amening right now. So you got to understand this. So I literally, in context to that time frame of my life, was just learning how to walk by faith. And the first thing that hit my mind was, there's the phone right next to my bed. I'm reaching over, didn't have cell phones back then. I'm reaching over to grab my phone to call my boss and call in sick. And right about the time I went to punch that first number, but thank God for the Holy Spirit. I said, thank God for the Holy Spirit. He reminded me what I said the night before. You want to know what I heard from the Holy Spirit? Clear as a bell. I thought you said you were healed. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He didn't say what God said. He was saying what I said. Yeah. I thought you said you were healed the other night. Yeah. Yeah. Last night, I thought you said you were healed. Yeah. And I sat there for a minute and I thought about that. I didn't realize the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I said, that's right, I'm healed. Next phrase. If you're healed, what do healed people do? They don't call in sick. If you call in sick, you're not acting on the Word of God. Thank you for your amends about that. You're not acting on the word of God if you call in sick. You're acting on sick. 
If I act on sick, I'm not going to receive heaven's help. I'm not going to receive the grace of God that's available to me. I'm not earning anything from God. Healing's already been provided. I'm not earning anything from God. I'm just acting on what he said. So I put the phone down and I said, you're going to work, body. You are healed in Jesus' name. Do you think I felt like doing that? Lord, no. I could barely drag myself out of bed, get, get, get dressed, get my clothes on, went to work. Well, believe it or not, this was a Friday. This was a Friday. And on Friday night, guess what I was uh, actually supposed to do that Friday night? Go to Mesquite, get on a bull. I was entered at Mesquite Rodeo that weekend. And I was up Friday night. I got off work. About 4 o'clock, I got home. Man, you want to talk about feeling worse by the time I got home? Guess what I did all day in that, in that rock truck? Guess what I did all day in that rock truck? I'm sick. Boy, I wish I wasn't so sick. Sure it would be nice to be healed. No, that wouldn't have worked. Guess what I did? I claimed my healing. Body, you're healed in Jesus' name. Thank God I'm healed in Jesus' name. God's word is truth. I believe the truth. I kept feeding on you know, stuff I was listening to uh, that day as well. And guess what? When I got home, I didn't feel any better. You know, it's almost a guarantee, almost a given. The first time you really go to stand on faith, the devil's going to push you to the umpt degree that he can. You listening? So I then actually got home, got a little something to eat, didn't really feel like eating, but ate a little something. And I grabbed my rigging bag. Normally, you know, you throw it over your shoulder. I'm dragging it. I'm dragging it to my little barn apartment over to the front door. And I just did not feel like going even to Mesquite that night to get on a bull. But I drag it over to the door, and I see my little couch. Remember my little couch? I see my little couch, which my legs hung off of, by the way. It's a little couch. I see my little couch. I'm like, boy, that sure looks good. <laughs> so I go lay my body down on that couch, and as I'm laying there, I hear these words. Now you're going to let the devil rob you of something you want that you enjoy doing. I said, no, I'm not. Man, I got up, and I grabbed my bag, and I drug it out there the truck, and I threw it in. I go to Mes- Am I boring you? No. I go to Mesquite Rodeo that night. And I actually did not have, have any desire to get on this bull. And I was still physically just, I mean, drained. So I did very little to get ready, just kind of minimal stuff, sat down. I'm just waiting to get this over with, you know. And so I just, but I kept claiming my healing. Now, I don't know why. I, I'm not, it's not like God chose it this way or I don't know why it happened this way. But I got on my bull. I was able to get on my bull. I got bucked off that night. But the minute I hit the ground and I got up, guess what? Every symptom was gone. Every symptom gone. I got up, grabbed my bull rope, had a big smile on my face. My buddies thought there was something wrong because I was smiling about getting bucked off. No, I was smiling about being healed. But guess when I was healed? Way back before that, the night before, when I got revelation, I'm not going to be. Already am. What about no corresponding action? No corresponding action? You don't get the grace of God. You don't get the help of God. Did I earn that? No, that was prepared beforehand for me to walk in. You see the balance of what grace is all about? What grace is for? Say, grace is to help me. But see, grace won't work without what? Corresponding action. So I acted upon the word of God. I simply stood my ground, stayed in faith, and guess what? I went home that night completely healed and well. There was people where I worked. I mean, they were off for days with the flu, man. But thank God I showed up the next day healthy, strong, and well. The truth is, I already was the day before. I didn't feel like it, but I believed it in Jesus' name. Could I get a better amen? Amen. So, number four in your notes, almost everything we know about grace came from the Apostle Paul, yet even he said he does not set aside the grace of God. We don't set it aside by the context of there's nothing I need to do. No, you act on the Word of God. Acting on the Word of God is not setting aside grace. Can you get that point? Verse 20, I walk by faith in the Son of God. 21, that's not setting aside the grace of God. Do you see that? Galatians 2.20, the life I now live, I live by faith in the... And in doing so, verse 21, that doesn't mean you set aside the grace of God. No, you're engaging grace. Acting upon the word by faith is engaging the grace of God. If you want to get heaven's help, guess what you got to do? Have corresponding action that goes with your faith. All right, Hebrews chapter 12. Am I helping you at all tonight? I'm helping me if I'm not helping you. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, you, there's, there's been some times I've had to stand through some other physical battles as well because at times I've gotten to a point where I've not been feeding on the Word of God like I should and my faith has gotten weak. 
And so I got to go back. Faith doesn't come by what I heard all those 30 plus years ago by me studying healing back there in those time frame of, that time frame of my life during those three months. It comes by hearing. Yes. By continual hearing. Amen. Yes. But without corresponding action, guess what you're missing out on? The grace of God. So this is where the modernist who just simply says, doesn't matter how, how we live or what we do, they're not going to experience the fullness of God's grace. Because they misunderstand. They think we're teaching people that you're earning something from God. You're earning nothing. You're walking in what he prepared beforehand. But faith without works ain't going to do it. Faith has to have corresponding action. Can you see that? Number five, there are 12 Bible reasons. Twelve Bible reasons that we have been given, excuse me, that we have been given grace. Twelve Bible reasons that we've been given grace. Four of them are listed here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 28. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 28 says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, aren't you glad, yeah. which cannot be shaken. Amen. We talked about the kingdom this morning. Notice, let us have what? Grace. Let us have what? Grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. How are you going to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear? Heaven's help. Heaven's going to help you do it. Grace is going to help you do it. God's going to enable you to do it. You have a Holy Spirit living in you who will help help empower you. And like for me that night, thank God for the Holy Spirit that reminded me, I thought you said you already are healed. That's right, I am. Put the phone down, acted upon the Word of God, and finally got results. So here's the first four of 12 Bible reasons that we've been given grace. Okay? 5A. First of all, grace has been given to us so we can do what? Serve God. He says right there in verse 28. Notice again, let us have grace by which we may do what? Serve God. So we've been given grace to serve God. To serve Him, to walk out what He has for us as a child of God. That is what we do in relationship to grace as well. We've been given grace so we can serve Him. 5B, grace has been given to us also so that we can serve God in a way that is what? Acceptable Acceptable unto Him. You know what's acceptable unto Him? Doing obviously what's right in the sight of God, absolutely. But what's also acceptable unto Him is us receiving what He has for us, which requires action. It's not acceptable for, it is never acceptable to God for people to not receive the benefits of what he died and paid for. Acceptable meaning he accepts it, it's okay, no big deal. No, he wants you to receive the benefits he paid for. Amen. 5C, number three, grace has also been given to us so that we can do what? Serve God with reverence. Reverence to God, honoring God. Because grace is a free gift, guess what you should do? You should reverence God. 5D, grace has been given to us also so that we can serve the Lord with what? Godly Godly fear. To truly recognize godly fear means that we are going to walk in a position with God as it relates to Him in a way in which we are not going to be rebellious. We truly do fear Him in the sense that we have an awe and reverence for our God. Therefore, we're going to uh, uh, turn around and walk in the light of what He tells us because if we do, guess what we're going to walk in? Grace. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Now, these, these verses here are not real popular verses with the modern-day grace message, but they're in the New Testament. Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Say, praise the Lord, everybody. So, we are talking about here in closing 12 things as to why grace was given. We've looked at four, number 6. On the back of your notes, the other eight reasons grace has been given to us are found here in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. 11, for the grace of God, say the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to what? All men. All men. men. Because the truth is, if you really want to know what is grace in its essence, it's Jesus. Jesus is the grace of God. He's the one that provided for you everything that's needed. He's the one that did it. That's why we walk by faith in the Son of God and not set aside grace. If you walk by faith in the Son of God, you don't set aside your belief in Him and what He did. You act upon it. Verse uh, 12. Notice this. This grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. What do we do? Deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That we should live what? Soberly. 
righteously, and godly in this present age. Let's read it again, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. What is grace also doing? Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Who, verse 14, gave himself for us, aren't you glad? That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous again for good works, which he again prepared for us to walk in beforehand. 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Titus was a New Testament pastor that Paul had raised up and he was writing to. So on number six on your notes, here are the other eight of the 12 reasons as to why grace was given according to these verses. 6a, grace has been given to do what? Grace is a teacher. It helps teach us how to live. Grace, Jesus Christ, heaven's help, teaches us how to live. Did he not give us an example in the, in the context of the Gospels how to live? Did he not teach us things that we should know about how we're to live? He's grace itself. So grace has been given to do what? To teach us. 6B, grace has been given also to us so that we can deny what? Ungodliness. Ungodliness. These are all in those verses you just read. 6C, grace has been given to us so that we can do what? Deny worldly lusts. What's grace? Heaven's help. 6D, grace has been given to us so that we can live soberly today. E, grace has been given to us so that we can live righteously in days like these. F, grace has been given to us also so that we can live what? Godly or God-like in essence in this present age. God-like meaning doing the works that Jesus himself did. G, God, grace has been given to us so that we know to do what? Look for his coming. Grace has been given to us to know to look for his coming. Matter of fact, the Bible's clear. It says that if we keep looking forward to his coming, that looking forward to his coming will cause us to live a life that honors God as we're prepared for his return. Because we're not going to live like a foolish virgin. We're going to live like a wise one. And H, grace has been given to us so that we are what? Tell me. Zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. So these are 12 reasons why grace was given. Grace is so mistaught by many today. Nothing new though, because if you go back to the book of Jude, you'll find out it was happening even in the days of the New Testament. Go to Hebrews chapter 3 as we're closing. Hebrews chapter 3. In the book of Jude, he actually tells us there that there are those who take God's grace to be able to use it in a way that they can live however they want. Well, we're, it's just like we talk about today. Say by grace, I can do anything I want. No, uh, grace wasn't given so you can do whatever you want. Grace was given to help you do what God wants you to do with your life. Grace is heaven's help. He'll help you do it. Aren't you glad? Amen. Say, I'm not on my own. How do you know? Who lives in you? Christ lives in you. He's there to help you. He's there to nudge you. He's there to guide you. He's, here to, he's there to correct you and deal with you and, and rebuke you when you do wrong. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Watch this. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ, grace himself, grace himself. We have become partakers of Christ if, condition, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to what? To the end. Wow. For we have become partakers of Christ. You can say it this way. We have become partakers of grace. You listening? He is that grace. We have, been, we have become partakers of grace if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence, our faith, our belief, steadfast to the end. So in kind of bringing this to a complete circle now, remember what we started with, John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? Listen, all who want to receive grace can if they do what? Whoever believes. Believes. So our believing is not just I believed. Our believing is I believed. I still believe and I will keep on. And if I am, what does that mean? I have corresponding action that goes along with what I believe. And therefore, I'm a partaker of grace. Not earning anything. I'm walking in what he prepared beforehand. 
So we are partakers of Christ, and you could actually put a little note next to that, partakers of grace, if you again do what? If you keep your confidence in Christ all the way to the end. Here's another way to look at grace. Grace is nothing more than me and you looking to Jesus, grace itself, and saying, I put total faith in what he did for me. Now, now to re- receive what he did for me, I got to have what? Corresponding action to what I believe in. I can't just believe in what he said is mine without having corresponding action to act upon it. Amen? Amen. If I believe that I will reap if I sow, guess what? You're not going to reap until you... So, you can believe in sowing and reaping, right? You can believe in it, but it's not going to work for you until you start doing what? Sowing, right? You can believe in it, but until you act on it, it's not going to work. Can I get a better amen? So, thank God for his grace. I said, thank God for his grace. I, you know, I have a word for you, Lakshmi. I want you to receive this from the Lord tonight. I have a word for Anshu. I want you to start working with Anshu Every day to get him to speak from his own mouth, I'm healed in Jesus' name. And then change that to my body is completely healed in Jesus' name. Amen? I know he understands things you say to him. But I believe that's a corresponding action that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me about on you for a long time. That we got to get some action going to our faith with on you. And of course, he can't do that on his own without help. But one of the ways you can do that is get on you to start declaring over himself, I'm healed in Jesus' name. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen? And I'm telling you guys, when you start doing what? Put corresponding action to your faith in Jesus. What are you going to be a partaker of? God's grace. God's grace. Aren't you glad about that? Hallelujah. So you need to look at your life. Realize grace is heaven's help. Jesus himself. Everything he did for you. To be a partaker of that, is, not, is it enough just to believe? It is not. I've got to act upon what I believe. That's where the challenge comes in. That's where the challenge comes in. Because when it comes to different circumstances, example, I believe in God's grace to provide us what's needed to build that building. We have to have corresponding action that goes along with that. We can't just sit back and believe somehow it's going to happen because God's not going to bring metal from heaven wouldn't it be cool if he did? Yeah. But he's not going to bring metal from heaven and angels to erect it. We've got to have some action to our faith that goes along with what we know we believe God told us. And when we do, guess what we start entering into? Heaven's help. Grace comes alongside you to see to it that what obviously he promised comes to pass. So we understand the balance now of knowing what grace is all about, why we have it, but also our corresponding action is how we enter into it. Amen? We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.